All right, let's get started. Thank you so much to everybody uh, for taking time out of what is, I'm sure, a very busy weekday night for you. Um, I want to begin uh, briefly just to talk a little bit about the general format of what we're going to do today. I'm also a little out of breath. Sorry. I had to run far. Uh, so Chloe here is going to host. Chloe is my legislative aide. Uh, she's based in Albany. I am sitting here in my district office in Fairport. Uh, if I move, you can see Packet's Landing across from me. Uh, we are going to um, unmute you. I'm gonna, I got your questions in advance. I'm going to say your name, the general topic you're gonna discuss, and then I'm gonna unmute you. If you don't wanna speak, that's totally fine. I can read your question and respond to you. Just send Chloe a message in the chat saying you don't wanna be called on, but you like your question addressed. We did get 40 questions in advance, so great job. Uh, we probably aren't going to be able to get to all of them. So to the extent that some of them are under the same topic, I might call on one like representative person to talk about the COVID vaccine or to talk about high acres. Um, so if I don't call on you and you wanna discuss it, there is on the bottom of your screen, something that says Q&A. Q&A goes just to me and Chloe. No one else sees your question. It doesn't have to identify you. Uh, so you can send a question there. Chloe's gonna be monitoring Q&A and chat. Um, questions should be put to us in I think the Q&A space. Uh, if we do have time to take extra questions, we will, but I'm going to give priority to the people who gave us questions in advance. Um, and I wanna thank all of you for bearing with us with this electronic format. Obviously, we would much prefer to meet you in person. Uh, I hope that we will be able to, when the weather warms up, maybe host one of these uh, outside. And then uh, once we get more back to normal in uh, an enclosed space. Uh, we are taking feedback. This is our first town hall. So if uh, something about this format uh, you love or you hate, tell us, because we love to improve this moving forward. Um, we're trying out this time. If you think there's a different time, we are open to suggestions. So please feel free to share that with us. Uh, I'm going to begin by first introducing uh, my, my other staff as well. Chloe, you can see. Uh, my chief of staff, Iris Beery, is also on this call. Uh, she is based here in Rochester. And Heather New is my legislative director. She is on the other side of that wall, right here in Fairport as well. Uh, for those of you who don't really know me, I'm Jen Lunsford, and I am your uh, New York State Assembly person. I represent Webster, Penfield, East Rochester, and the Parenton Fairport area, the whole town of Parenton. I'm a Parenton resident myself. And uh, I live with my husband, Scott, and my four-year-old son, McKay. Before uh, being elected to the New York State Assembly, I was an attorney for uh, 11 years. I handled plaintiff side personal injury, workers' compensation, and social security disability, which means I work with sick and disabled people. And in that role, I had a great opportunity to interact with a really broad variety of people, different government agencies, local nonprofits. I got exposure to a lot of different areas of law. And in the short time we've been in office, we've been in office that's proved to be uh, super valuable. I am so grateful to be coming into office with all that experience. Uh, Heather, my legislative director, is uh, also a uh, attorney. I stole her from Legal Aid where she focused on domestic violence issues. And um, I stole Iris from a uh, organization that focused on uh, nuclear deproliferation in Iran. Uh, Chloe comes to us from the legislative intern program. Uh, so she is our Albany expert, helping us find the copy paper, uh, which is harder than it seems. There's, everything is carbon copy forms. I don't know why. Uh, but I want to begin with um, kind of a general overview of what my job is and what we are doing for the community. So many people don't really know much about what our state government does. We, like the federal government, have an assembly and a Senate. They are equal houses of government. Uh, I'm in the assembly. There are 150 assembly people statewide. And in that role, we do all state business. We do the budget, state environmental laws, state criminal laws, uh, housing law, all of that runs through the state. We kind of touch everything. And I serve on five committees, children and families, 
environmental conservation, economic development, libraries, and local governance. Uh, that gives me a really unique opportunity, that confluence of different committees to serve this area really well. I'm very excited to have gotten all of these uh, particular committees. When I looked through the questions, the three areas that I saw highlighted the most were vaccine and COVID response questions, obviously, uh, environmental issues, particularly as they relate to high acres, and questions about our nursing home residents. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna start with those kind of big umbrella areas. And then um, after that, move into some of the more specific questions. Uh, I'm making sure the person I'm calling on is gonna be here. Uh, Christopher from Penfield, Dr. Christopher, uh, would you be willing to ask us your COVID question? Chris, do you see him? I do not see him. Chris Cassidy. Ah, there he is. I was back and forth on whether I should call people who they are from where they are, but I realized everyone's last name is listed there. So that's what I'm gonna call you. <laughs> so, Doctor. so I am here and I probably have the same question that you said 40 questions. I'm surprised 39 of them aren't about the COVID vaccine, but- uh, uh, It was a heavy leaning towards COVID question, so. <laughs> My, my issue right now is that every time I go on that New York State Am I Eligible site, there's never any appointments available. And I've been doing it now for two weeks solid, maybe not every 15 minutes, but very, very regularly. And I have never seen an appointment. There was a time about three or four days ago when there were all of a sudden appointments in Syracuse and Utica and Binghamton, um, Plattsburgh and Potsdam have had appointments for forever. I don't. That's not, I don't know why they have appointments and nobody else did. But anyhow, there was a time there for about two days when Syracuse, Binghamton, Utica had appointments and then they went away. Nothing ever showed up in either Rochester or, uh, um, or Buffalo. Uh, so what's going on? Um, is the vaccine coming to Rochester? How much, and my, my second point is that there's a very limited amount of transparency on what's going on. Is that we had, I know, we know nothing all we see is no appointments currently available, and that's the extent of it. You can go to Monroe County, you can go to the state site, you get virtually nothing. So what's going on? I share your frustration. Uh, we have this problem too. The communication has been terrible and siloed from the government. I have a call twice a week with the governor's office and twice a week with our local county. So I speak with Adam Bello and Dr. Mendoza twice a week and representatives from the governor's office, and I'm still dribbling out information. The vaccine has been in Monroe County since it was released. On average, we are getting roughly 1,500 doses a week, and the, uh, the state as a whole only gets about 300,000 doses per week. So we are divvying up 300,000 doses across 56,000 square miles and 19 million people. In Monroe County, we have the capacity to give 8,000 shots a week. We are only getting 1,500 doses. They keep telling us the rule is that we can only get as many doses as we can give out. We are done by like Wednesday afternoon because that's how fast we can do it. To some extent, the appointment process has been siloed. If you are a healthcare worker and you work inside a hospital system, stay within your hospital system. They will deliver you a vaccine. If you are 65 and older, they want you to go to the state site. If you are an essential worker, they want you to go to the county. I know that. You guys don't know that. I've been trying to communicate that. Uh, we, I got that information recently. Um, every time I get updates from the state, I try to put it out on social media. So following us on um, Facebook and Twitter is a, a good place to get whatever tiny nugget of information I can give to you. Um, but the reality is, is the second the appointments go up, they're gone because everyone is making the appointments immediately. There is no secret trick other than there are just not that many appointments. So literally you have to update almost continuously. People do are getting they, lucky. Do they open that website up on like an, like Monday mornings at 8 a.m. or I mean, when, when, when's, what's the secret time to go into it? And I have to tell you, like what I've seen is some of the teachers have a Facebook groups where they have figured out some backdoor trick to getting appointments somewhere. 
I legitimately don't know. Chloe, I'm actually going to ask you a question because Chloe fields a lot of these calls and is our direct liaison. Have you heard anecdotally of anybody having any positive experiences through one side or the other? No. <laughs> the, the short answer is no. Um, and, you know, on our end, we're trying to stay as informed as possible. We're calling in with the county every week, twice a week to kind of get updates. Um, and they pretty much our response has to be, be patient. It's coming. The kinks are being worked out, which is incredibly frustrating for us because we want to help. Um, and it's incredibly frustrating for you because you want the vaccine. Uh, but no, there has been no positive experience uh, as far as vaccines go. You know, we, we do genuinely share your frustration. These are like amongst the most common calls we get. We would love nothing more than to tell you I have a secret pipeline of appointments I can give you. Uh, and if I ever get them, I'll tell you. Uh, but that seems to be the issue. It's all supply-based, 100% supply-based. Uh, people are complaining, rightly so, that uh, the state has been micromanaging the delivery of the vaccine, but the reality is we don't get enough of them for that micromanagement to even matter. Frankly, we probably shouldn't have opened 1B until we knew we would have the capacity to serve 1B. 1B has 7 million people in it and we don't have anywhere near. If we gave out every shot we get instantly, it would still take us a year to uh, vaccinate all of 1B. I will say this though, just so everybody knows, because I've been hearing this. If you get your first shot, you are guaranteed your second shot. Your second shot has your name on it when you get your first one. So that's another one of the problems. We get 1500 shots per week and we're getting to a point where those 1500 shots are allocated as a second shot. Yeah. So people are already spoken for. Oh, because that may explain why nothing's showing up because basically everything that's coming in is just going to second. Cause we're probably three or four weeks from when this thing opened up anyhow. So that's about the timing. That's yeah. a good point. This is the struggle. And I, there was another question um, from, and I'm sorry, I'm going to flip through here, from Carla in Webster. Uh, I know that you'd called our office about this and you sent this through here asking if you traveled far away, you traveled to Buffalo, you traveled to Poughkeepsie to get a shot, can you get it locally? And unfortunately, right now, the answer is no, because that's just not how they're allocating the shot. The shot follows the, the route. So if you went somewhere for the first shot, you have have to get the second shot there because it literally has your name on it. Um, this system is terrible. Uh, no one is apologizing for it. Uh, everyone's pointing the finger other places. It is ultimately a supply problem. I know that there were other questions and I apologize if I'm asking your, answering your question. If you wanna speak, let us know. I just, I'm trying to keep everything sort of under one umbrella. Uh, there were several people asking us about when pharmacies are gonna start giving these shots. In the perfect world where we have vaccines, local pharmacies, your CVSs, your Walgreens are going to be giving shots to people 65 and older and then the rest of the population as an unfolds. That's in the works. We just don't have it right now. Right now we are running out of the convention center in the Dome Arena and those are the 65 and older sites. They are asking that the reason they want essential workers to call the, the um, County is because the county is doing like a separate venue of those shots. They're actually, we're, this is going to come off shocking. We're really good at this. Monroe County is doing better than the rest of the state in the administration of these shots. Um, so, as terrible as this is, we're the best of the terrible. It's, I, I do truly wish I had um, a better answer. I am going to, I know, um, Chloe, you're monitoring the chat and the QA. Are there um, other COVID specific things right now queued up that people want to talk about before I shift to another topic? And that doesn't mean we can't go back. I'm just trying to maximize everyone's time here. Um, I am seeing that our friend Patrick has just sent us a very useful link. Um, Iris is going to keep track of all the links or materials that is being sent in the chat. Um, that pretty much looks like it's it right now. Doesn't look like there are any further questions about Fantastic. That. All right, and again, something comes up, you put it in the Q&A, we will get to it. Staying within the COVID response, I do wanna to touch on nursing homes because obviously this is a very serious issue. I will tell you my own father-in-law is hospitalized right now with COVID having picked it up in an assisted living facility. 
facility. This is a serious issue for me personally. It is a serious issue for everybody who has a loved one that they haven't seen in months. Um, I'm just gonna tell you from my personal perspective, uh, we hadn't seen my father-in-law, I think in four and a half months um, because every time, and he was in an assisted living facility, not even a skilled nursing facility. Every time we had an appointment to go see him, they had another COVID infection and they would lock down for another 10 days. And it was just this daisy chain of lockdowns. Um, so I, I do understand what the emotional toll is on families and how isolating that is for people in nursing homes. People in nursing homes are, not to mince words, they're, they're dying alone and they are failing to thrive. I know too many people who have loved ones who will only eat for them. I know what that's like. As an attorney, I handled nursing home fraud and abuse. I handled uh, neglect cases. I know a lot about nursing homes uh, and how terrible that situation can be. Um, but I do have a little bit of good news on this front. This past week, our local assemblyman, Harry Bronson, out of um, part of the city, Henrietta and Chai Lai, uh, he is the dean of our local delegation. He introduced the bill and it passed through the health committee to uh, designate a compassionate caregiver. That sometimes you hear this called an essential caregiver. There's kind of different lingo. We're calling it compassionate caregiver. You'll be able to designate one person who goes through all the same protocol the staff does in terms of PPE, in terms of testing, and they will be able to get into the nursing home to visit their loved one. Um, because nursing homes have a legitimate interest in protecting everyone inside the nursing home, of making sure everyone is safe. We did agree that this would only be one particular person, um, but I hope that we will see that bill passed very shortly. Uh, moving through committee is kind of the most important part. Uh, and I think that that's gonna open up a lot of doors. Uh, truth be told, once that's open, it's up to the facilities to um, make sure that they are adhering to that. I can tell you as someone who worked with nursing homes, their biggest concern is the safety of their residents. And I think that they might be somewhat resistant to allowing people inside even with those parameters because they're nervous and I understand them being nervous. Uh, so if after that bill's passed, which it has not been signed by the governor yet, it has not been passed by either house, but I expect it to be. Um, I, again, follow me on social media. That's the best way to keep up to date on those things. We post all the time. Um, we also will have a newsletter. This has been very overwhelming <laughs> coming into a budget season remotely. It's been, we've been doing a lot of work. This is no joke, probably my 10th Zoom today. Uh, we will eventually have a newsletter that we send out once a month that does a summary of things, but social media is much quicker. It's every single day. Uh, if after that bill's passed, you encounter a facility that's not working with you, I want you to please let us know. That's exactly the kind of thing we need to know about. Um, would anybody, uh, I sh probably should have called on someone for the nursing home question. Does anybody want to specifically discuss the nursing home issue? Everyone has the raise hands. Yeah, there's also a raise hand function. Oh, here we go. There's a hand. Karen. Oh, Karen. I'm going to guess this is the Karen I referred to. <laughs> Welcome, Karen. Hi, Karen. You're muted. There you are. Hello. Hi. Um, I guess my question is I'm thrilled that the bill is moving through the process. I, I just have to say the concern is it's moving at a snail's pace. These folks are literally dying yeah. every day. How do we accelerate this? There doesn't seem to be a sense of urgency around this, to be honest. I will tell you, this is what urgent looks like in the government. Wow. Um, I know it feels very slow. This is actually very fast for a bill moving through. Um, we have, this bill was written indexed, put into committee, moved through the week it was submitted to the committee. It did not sit for a second. As soon as it was put in, it got a move through committee. So I know it's not fast enough because fast enough is um, six months ago. You know, that's the thing is right. fast enough is this already happened. Uh, and I'm right there with you. Um, but I want you to know that in our local delegation, 
Like this is an issue that matters to Harry. Harry was the chair of aging last year. So he's very concerned about our older population. This is an issue that matters a lot to me and the rest of our local delegation. We are pushing it through. I, I hope, I can't say for sure because I haven't spoken to the speaker about it. I'm hoping next week it comes up. Okay. Um, but it, it is moving through the process. And I have every expectation that once passed, it will get signed relatively quickly. <clears throat> because this, this isn't a bill that has money attached to it. Right. And that usually makes it move a little bit faster. Okay, thank you. Okay. But I, I hear you. Uh, this is an issue for me too. Um, we are doing everything that we can on our end to push it through. And making it through committee was kind of that big hurdle to get it up. Um, the uh, other larger issue where we got a lot of questions um, was High Acres. And I'm going to call on Nathan from Fairport. Nathan on the call? Nathan. I do I not thought I see saw him. Nathan. Nathan, if you're present, if you could raise your hands at the bottom. If not, I see Ellie. Room. Ellie can uh, ask me a question about High Acres. Ellie, also from Fairport. Ellie has raised her hands. Welcome, Ellie. Ellie from Fairport. Hello. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. We Hi. Can hear you. Well, tell us I all about High Acres. <laughs> not Tell everyone else. I know all about high acres. But sure. <laughs> so for folks who don't know, um, Parrington is home to a landfill called High Acres Landfill managed by Waste Management. And it spans between two neighboring towns, Parrington, which is in Monroe County and Macedon, which is not in Monroe County. And um, there has been an ongoing effort recently, I would say in the last three years. Um, I am not the most first person on this, but I am doing my best in recalling all the necessary information. Um, there has been a, a movement recently on behalf of residents of Parrington and Macedon and surrounding areas about trying to um, get waste management to stop uh, the trash trains that are coming from New York City. Um, and that is because the when those trains were allowed to come, I believe it was 2008, I could be wrong on that date. Um, they have, uh, they have, I don't know how many millions of tons of garbage is moved in every day. Um, but it is, it is, the smell is un, un it's unbearable, it's unbearable. And uh, we are very concerned about it as a um, I, I say we being fresher for the East side residents who were um, affected by this. Um, we are very concerned about the daily life of having to live with the smell. And uh, many of us are also concerned about the health effects down the road for our families, our children, et cetera. So um, we had had a forum recently in the last couple of weeks, bringing Jen's staff up to, up to speed on this and just wondering where things stand right now. Thank you, Ellie. Uh, so yeah, actually, uh, this, is, this is technically my second town hall because I had a town hall just with the residents um, who formed the group called Fresh Air for the East Side that are affected by this issue. Uh, for those of you who don't live in Parenton, this is the Parenton issue. This is the only Parenton issue who, as far as many people are concerned. Uh, this isn't just a landfill that smells a little bit. This is a landfill that smells in Penfield. Um, I have Penfield residents who complain to me about this Parenton landfill. This landfill, for those of you who can kind of orient yourself, uh, is down, if you can picture where the Fairport High School is, it's down the, over there. And there are people at the Penfield Wegmans that can smell this landfill from time to time. It, I would say second most popular email that I get is about this landfill. Uh, this is something that I have been uh, aware of since 2018 when I was running for state Senate. Uh, when I first uh, came into office, this was my first call. When I called um, our bill drafting people and our, uh, there's uh, people who kind of are in charge of legislation, I called the, the person in charge of environmental conservation to get them to tell me everything we had on landfills. Um, I made this the literal first stop. Uh, I then also had a town hall that was very well attended uh, where we heard from a lot of different people about the experience they've been having with this landfill. And I have had two emails and two in-person, well, a Zoom meeting and an in-person meeting with waste management about this. Um, we are going to be um, spearheading efforts at the state level the reality is, as people in Parenton are well aware, the landfill issue is a function primarily of volume. 
the volume of trash coming into the landfill is too high. The problem is it's below oh, the permit cap. They're allowed to bring in that much garbage. Um, we need to figure out a way before that contract comes up, which is several years from now, to try to deal with this issue because until the contract is up for renewal, they can continue to bring in this much trash. At the state level, we can take a broader view. And something that I am very passionate about is waste reduction and landfill diversion. We have made that our um, key piece of environmental interest. When we had the environmental conservation budget hearing, I asked questions to the DEC commissioner about there's $40.6 million in the budget. How are we using that for um, landfill diversion? That's specifically solid waste management money. Uh, there's a lot of movement around what's called extended producer responsibility. We're going to get a little in the weeds, and I'm going to ease up on this for people who don't need to know this much about it. But what extended producer responsibility does is it puts the onus back on the producer of an item to limit the amount of waste that comes with it. So when you buy a pair of shoes, does it need to be stuffed with paper? When you buy a box of cereal, does it need to have you know, six extra inches of air in it to make it look like you're buying more. It's going to help us deal more broadly with the waste that we make because we need to talk about waste from uh, when it's created to where it goes, the whole life cycle. And at the state level, we can take on those big issues. There is a real thirst for this now. We are in a good position. Uh, last year, there was a, a, a paint bill about paint recycling. Uh, we're going to be moving into paper products soon, uh, mattress recycling. So there's a lot of really big, exciting, I guess my definition of exciting might be different than other people's, um, policy around waste issues that we can address. Um, those of you who might be able to hear a train, I'm very close to the train track myself here at Fairport. Um, and I also have had some very candid and perhaps stern discussions with waste management about the way they've been communicating with the affected residents. Um, I do not think they have been doing a uh, acceptable job. I think in many ways they have been dismissive. Uh, they have dug their own hole with the way they have dealt with this and I have let them know. Uh, town board person Meredith, uh, Broadband Stockman was on some of my emails uh, and could attest to my tone. And I will have you know, I am having none of it. Uh, I do not like what they have been doing or how they've been communicating. Uh, I do not like the DEC hotline. I do not like the way Towpath has been treating our residents. And I want you to know that I hear it. I see it and I am on your side. We're gonna figure out a way to address this as best we can uh, given our limited abilities before that permit cap is renegotiated. Um, okay, so, so I'm going to move on to some other issues. Again, if you wanna talk about other things we've discussed, stick it in the q and I will try to get to it. We're coming on six o'clock. Um, I'm not gonna keep you guys all night. Feel free to drop off if I have lost your interest. Um, but I'm actually, I'm gonna go to, I see uh, the Fairport mayor, Julie Domaretz is on this call and she had a question for me about AIM funding. I wish some of these issues were sexier for people. So sometimes state government's a little in the weeds. Um, this is Pat. Is Julie on the call or Pat? Uh, Julie, are you Pat? It's Julie. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm also the one who posted the link to the Finger Lakes Vaccine Hub.com. It's oh, right. F L V A C C I N H U B.com. Um, and that's a website that is kind of all encompassing both state, county, and um, the um, medical uh, hubs locally to try and get more answers to vaccinations. Um, so my question to you was, uh, how do we as local communities get AIM funding back, which is aid I'm not going to get the acronym correct. It's aid, to aid and incentive to municipalities. There we go. Aim incentive or aid incentive to municipalities. Mm. Um, you know, we normally we have not been seeing any increases of in this. And then last year, uh, we were supposed to start receiving our share of internet sales mm. tax. The state chose to 
take that internet sales tax and say that we could get our AIM funding out of the internet sales tax so that revenue is now lost to the local communities, both the county and the towns and villages that get uh, sales tax sharing from the county. And then on top of that, with COVID, they cut the AIM funding that we are going to get uh, by 20%. And then there's an additional um, um, 6%, I believe it's 6% that's going to go to hospitals and nursing homes um, that cuts into that for this year as well. And um, the state seems to forget that this is money that helps communities operate their snow plowing and their road workers. And in, for the village of Fairport, our DPW garbage pickup. Um, so uh, anything that we can do from a statewide perspective to get that AIM funding restored, but also taking it out of the internet sales tax bracket and putting it back in the state um, would be greatly appreciated. We, we need that funding to help keep our local governments going. And I know from a federal perspective, uh, they seem to think that state and local municipalities don't um, necessarily matter so much um, on the, in the previous year's agenda. Um, we're hoping that we will see some movement in that now that we have a different Congress this year. Uh, so thank you, Julie. I also apologize if you can hear this foghorn behind me that I think you might also be able to hear at Julie's house. So you're probably getting it back and forth. Um, I think it stopped. So the AIM funding has been a huge issue in our budget discussions recently. If you look at the executive budget, the AIM funding is gone. And uh, in its place is something called AIM related expenses. And that is the sales tax that Julie is talking about. Um, I made a big gigantic stink about it. Um, in our uh, initial budget review for local governments. I did it again in schools. I did it again in environmental conservation. Every time I get an opportunity to say AIM, I do, because AIM is broad. AIM doesn't just give the uh, town the ability to plow their streets. It gives them the ability to enact some of the environmental policies we're asking them to do. You know, when I pass these great bills that help us with clean water, water and reducing uh, you know, lead and all of these clean air bills. We need local municipalities to be able to enact some of these new rules and we need to give them money behind it. So one of the things I've been uh, focusing on in my messaging is that the governor loves to brag about how we passed the biggest, baddest environmental policy bill in the whole country, that we are nationwide leaders in environmental policy. And then he doesn't put the money in behind it. It's not just environmental bonds. It's not just DEC funding, it's AIM funding. It's everywhere. So you have a huge proponent in me for AIM funding. I can tell you um, every, New York City doesn't get AIM funding. So this isn't an issue you hear from a lot of electeds because proportionately, everyone talks about downstate, but you have to remember that everything across a bridge from New York City uh, is not New York City. Westchester gets AIM funding, um, you know, the boroughs do, but then Nassau and Suffolk County get AIM funding. So I wanna carve out New York City specifically because my Long Island friends also care about AIM funding. Uh, we are all hopping up and down about it. And I'm hoping that we get that restored back. Um, it's still not going to be enough. And it's restored back. It's going to be at that 2019 level at best, because uh, this is not the year to be um, increasing funding. You know, if you look through this budget, it's very austere. Um, it is cutting every single non-essential thing the governor can think of, because also we are preparing. I, again, I apologize for getting into the weeds on this. We are preparing a budget. I'm gonna step back. Let me explain the budget. So here's how the budget process works. The executive, the governor, puts out an executive budget. He presents it at a big press conference. It has a fancy name. Uh, and that happens a couple weeks ago. Then we take a week or two in the assembly and then separately in the Senate to pour through it come up with our own analysis of it. And then we have a whole bunch of joint budget hearings, 10, 12 hour hearings that I have been on 
for weeks. I live on Zoom now, where we talk to uh, stakeholders and people who are affected by these budget cuts. And then we put, I as a member, uh, individually, my office puts together a letter saying, here are the things that we think should be in the budget. Um, a caucus, the upstate caucus, for example, the women's caucus, we might put together a letter, the committees might put together a letter, and then the speaker of the assembly and the president of the Senate sit down and come up with what they, what they each separately call a one house bill. So the assembly gets a budget, the Senate gets a budget, and then there's three budgets, the governor's budget, the assembly budget, and the Senate budget. And then that's, you might have heard the phrase three men in a room. Um, what that really is, is just a representative for each of these budgets. In reality, thousands of people have informed those processes. It would just be impossible for all of us to stand in a room and negotiate it. We physically couldn't do it, it'd be too many people. Uh, so they negotiate the budget, horse trade back and forth, and that's how we end up with a budget. Um, we are in that knee deep in that process right now. <coughs> so um, AIM funding is definitely gonna be one of the things in my budget letter in the uh, upstate caucuses budget letter in local governments. I think every one of my committees can talk about AIM funding. So know that you have a friend in us and we will fight for it because we know how important it is. Um, so I am getting notes from people saying there are a number of questions about school opening. Um, I have also been discussing this issue at great length. I've discussed this issue with teachers, with superintendents, with doctors, with the governor's office, with the Department of Health. There are so many different people in on this discussion. And I am the mom of a four-year-old who was home with me for three straight months, then went back to daycare. And we have had periods where he has been back out because of outbreaks. Working with your children at home, extremely challenging. Believe me, I am with you but also the incredible toll this is taking on our kids. I can tell you, again, my son, not in traditional school, in preschool, um, he had potty train regressions. He had emotional issues from just not being with his friends, not seeing his peers. We cannot discount when we talk about prioritizing the health and safety of our kids that the social emotional part of this is part of that health and safety. And that our kids need better in-person instruction. You know, they're not learning as well. We're losing entire school years. Our kids with IEPs, our students' disabilities are being underserved, tremendously underserved. They can't do OT and PT remotely the way they can in real life. Um, I know all those things. But what I'm hearing, practically speaking, from just a practical point of view, is the science says that we need to maintain social distance. And I know that there's been this idea floating around that there's some science that says three feet is sufficient. And that's still not what the CDC says. It's not what the county government says. They're still saying six feet. But even with three feet of space, there's simply not enough classroom space or staff in any of these schools in our district to accommodate that distancing. Uh, and what I have heard from leadership in schools, and these are, these are people who run schools, this isn't the governor's office, these are the people doing the work, is that they don't feel like they can bring their staff back until there has been a critical mass of vaccinations. And some of that has to do with access. What they have said to me is like, we're not gonna make people get the vaccine, but they need to be able to make the choice. They need to have access to it such that they can decide, I wanna be vaccinated or I don't. Such that if you decide not to get vaccinated and you get sick, that's on you. That's a decision that you made. Uh, and I'll tell you, I heard just today from one of our local school leaders that 97% of people in that district that they surveyed said they wanted the vaccine which is great. Everyone should get the vaccine. I can't stress it enough. Um, but that until they have that vaccination, it's too much of a risk to them. The kids, generally speaking, it's not to say there's no risk to the kids. They haven't been getting that sick. They haven't, you know, 
kids luckily for the most part have been protected. Um, even when they do get sick, they get pretty mild symptoms, but that doesn't mean that they don't infect their teachers. The average school bus driver, 63 years old, we are between a rock and a hard place on it, but we can make small strides. I know that we gotten a lot of outreach from parents and students and coaches asking us to reopen sports. Um, and I'm going to tell you, it was the grassroots effort of people telling me it was a problem of calling my office and emailing me and letting me know that was a problem that made us ask the question. There are tens of thousands of problems at any given time. And if I don't know that my constituents care about it, then I, I don't know to prioritize it. So I'm asking you, and I may come to regret this, but please, Chloe, who answers my email, will come to regret this. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, she does a spectacular job. I have the best staff in the whole wide world. Um, we need to be told that things are an issue. So we had a lot of success. I coordinated all the um, signatures for a letter from the majority caucus to get the governor to change that rule. Uh, we are now working on music. I have now started to hear from people that in-person music is a, obviously something people want. I played violin through college. I was not a sports kid. I was an orchestra kid, an orchestra and theater kid. It may come as a shock to some of you. I was not a jock. Uh, but that um, this is something that we can start to move on. There are special masks kids can use for choir, that this is a way we can start, you know, bringing them back in. We just don't at this point, from what I'm hearing, I am not an educator. I am not a doctor. So all I can do is rely on the people who are experts in these issues and tell me where the science is, where the administration is, where the money is, how we can do this. We can get have a whole nother conversation about the education budget, but we do need to fund our schools to get more PPE, to set up our classrooms in a way that facilitates as many kids in at a time. They're simply, I, I again, had a conversation today with one of our local school superintendents who said, simply doesn't have the space or the staff to have all of the students in the building at once. It just doesn't have it. Our, you hear about some of these rural schools who were able to do it. They're much, much, much smaller than our bigger suburban schools. Um, but we are all working together all the time because these kids, they're suffering and we know they're suffering. And we want them not just to excel academically, but to excel social emotionally. And that's the real thing. And I know that our teachers feel it. I hear from our teachers about the way they see their kids suffering. So I want you to know that we hear this, we are constantly working on it, constantly hearing new things about it. And I will make it a priority to follow the science and make sure that as we get updates and as we get more vaccines that we are continuously making new decisions. Um, but I just, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. When I'm talking to school leaders, they're talking about when they will feel comfortable reopening schools in September. That's the, that seems to be the conversation the schools are having with me um, because that's how they seem to feel the rollout of the vaccine is going. If we suddenly get a dramatic uptick in vaccines, that's really what it is. It all comes back to supply of vaccines. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm a parent, I'm a working parent. I have a kid who needs his people. You know, he's been in full-time daycare since he was a baby. He never, he never knew life without seeing other kids every day. And I see it in him. Um, I think we also need to be cognizant of what school looks like when kids get back in kids that haven't been together in a year. It's especially some of the younger kids and some of the older kids going to be mayhem. Um, we need to have mental health counselors to help people deal with some of the issues. I think that we have bred a micro generation of germaphobes. You know, my kid, he freaks out sometimes if I touch his skin because of the germs and it breaks my heart that that's something that he thinks about and something that's gotten in his head. Um, and again, our, our special needs students too, I think about all the time.
but the, the gap that we've seen in their um, progress, uh, that's something that we're gonna need to fund extra to make up for. So we, we see all that, we know all of that, and we're gonna, we're gonna fight for the safest possible option for everybody and know that when I say safety, I don't just mean COVID. I think about the mental health too when I think about kids' safety. Um, I'm seeing there's a bunch of comments and questions. Chloe, are there follow-ups? Yeah, Jen, uh, we have Lisa, who I believe is going to continue this question on sure. COVID in, in school. So Lisa, you are now able to speak. Just Yep. Hello. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I've been following the school situation closely. I'm a parent of four school-age kids in Fairport. Um, so as far as the science goes, the WHO, the European CDC, the American Academy of Pediatrics, and the Harvard Public School of Health um, or School of Public Health have all said that three feet is adequate scientifically. Basically, the only organization that people can cite anymore that hasn't said that is um, the US CDC, which just re recently released a study showing that it is there is very minimal spread um, in schools based on their controlled study, and also that it's safe for teachers to go back before everyone's vaccinated. Um, so really, I feel like there's not scientifically a leg to stand on with the, the scientific argument. And then in addition, there's no leg to stand on when the kids are allowed to wrestle and play basketball. That's far less than three feet of space. The high school students are far more at risk. So I just feel like all these arguments that are being made don't really stand up. And I know I've talked to our superintendent and our board of education, and they said they want the kids back. They want the three foot rule in Fairport and that they would be able to accommodate that at least with the elementary school kids, um, but that they're not getting it from the, from the state government. And one of the concerns they have is that even if we're wait, saying we're waiting for more vaccine, well, they need like, they need lead time. So they need to know what's the metric. Like if once X number of people are vaccinated or have had the option or what is, what's that metric so they could be looking ahead and planning instead of getting one of these Friday night messages from the governor like, hey, guess what? Immediate, you know, now that we are available to go back to school. So I think we really need to be, I don't think the scientific argument holds up. And I don't think that, I think some superintendents do want the three feet rule changed. And I think they need some advanced notice. Um, so like to, to set some metrics that we can be looking forward to to get the three foot rule, get kids back in more. Um, first, I certainly hear you on, on the planning and, um, and a frustration that we have with the governor's office just generally. Could you bring Lisa back up? Just because I want to be able to um, back and forth with her. Um, that uh, sometimes the governor is giving very, very short uh, timelines on a myriad of things, even beyond school. That's a, a constant complaint that we have. Um, I have read that American uh, Academy of Pediatrics study um, the CDC, the US CDC, is traditionally extremely conservative. They just are like the most conservative um, health organization. Um, I have not seen the WHO, and I will, I'm actually going to ask my staffs on this call. I'm just going to say it out loud. Somebody find me the WHO study. Um, send they'll it get it to me. If you want. And that would be awesome. If you already have it, please send it to me. Um, mm -hmm. Moving governments when the CDC is not in line, it's it's very challenging, um, but I hear you. I have been told by uh, some of our other districts that even the three foot rule, um, they wouldn't be able to accommodate it. Seeing it, I mean, particularly with the elementary school kids, elementary school, Zoom school is insane. It's nonsense. Um, so if we could at least partially move kids back, I'm a big fan of moving the elementary kids back um, just because they, they seem to be able to um, handle the remote schooling uh, less well than some of our older students are. Um, but I hear you and I'm telling you, you show me the science, I advocate for it. I'm where the science is. I have no skin in the game of keeping kids out of school. I want the kids back in school, um, but I also want everybody to be safe. And this is where we are. Um, if we can get, you know, again, if that CDC is gonna be challenging, but I will certainly bring up those studies uh, on my call with the governor on my call with uh, Dr. Mendoza and get their take on it. And I'll report back to you about what we hear. Uh, the again, only the thing fact that they like are patting themselves on the back for letting high-risk sports start again, like that's not in line with the CDC recommendations. 
and I appreciate you adjusting the music too, but like, I just, I don't understand why they can let that happen and not school. You know, and I'll tell you, cause I was involved in the, the high risk sports, uh, enough other states had been doing it where we could look at the numbers and see that people who'd been playing football, see what the infection rates had been. And there's actually a couple sports, particularly hockey, where the numbers were a little high. But if you really dug into the numbers, what we found was that it wasn't the games. It was the social events around. Things like hockey have tremendous travel. So you had kids staying in hotel rooms, eating team meals. It was the kind of the stuff around the sports. The high risk game about school, though, like the Wisconsin study that the CDC did, um, you know, the your the European countries, they just issued all of their data from all of their months that were open. They were not doing six feet of distancing and they were not masking under the age of 12. And they still were seeing numbers the same or better than ours was spread in the classrooms and in the community. It was not a problem even with that. Um, I know my family that's in Missouri, they are all masked, but they're not distancing and their numbers are not considerably different than ours. So there's similar data across the country for the academics too. I think what it really comes down to is which parents are the loudest and which lawsuits get filed. And that's really frustrating as a parent. That's where the seems to be coming from. I will say that whenever I bring up European studies, the, what I hear is that their community infection rate is lower that they're not a good one-to-one -one because the general community infection rate is so much lower. Um, whereas, you know, here we have certain places, like we just got back down to November levels here because of Christmas and Thanksgiving. And it just shows how quickly you can pop up. You know, one of the concerns we were having locally was we got real close to ICU capacity after Christmas. Uh, we went from having the lowest infection rate of any population over 500,000 people in the whole country to almost being at ICU capacity in a very, very short period of time. Uh, what I think we need to be prepared to do is try it and call it back if it's not working. And I think that's the fear a lot of people have is they don't wanna start it and then stop it again. But I think that's the only way to, to do it is to say we're, we're willing we to accept that this might not work. Yeah, you and know? I think that's what we did in the fall. Everyone said, oh, it's gonna last a month. It's gonna last six weeks and it's gone really well. And yeah, I mean, I think there's enough science, even in the European studies, they showed like two different areas that had very different infection rates. Mm -hmm. And they found that the spread was not significantly different in the schools, as long as they were following the precautions, it, it wasn't dependent on the community spread, what was happening in the schools. I would definitely like to see those studies. And I'll tell you that yeah, um, I have some confusion on. sometimes. Um, my son had an outbreak in his classroom. One of his teachers was COVID positive. They mask. The teachers are always masked. The kids, I mean, we're talking about four-year-olds. They're not social distancing. Um, they take their masks off for meals and for nap time. So there were large periods of the day where these kids were unmasked. The county government did not consider them quarantinable from a contact tracing perspective, despite the fact that their teacher had been infected. And the reason they told me was because the teacher was masked. They were masked most of the time and they maintained six feet of distance. So they didn't qualify. And I was like, that sounds like a bizarro rule to me. Not a kid in that class got sick. That's anecdotal, but not a kid in that class got sick. Um, of course, you know, we are dealing with a very young population where they may have been asymptomatically carrying and we don't know because that's how you see it in little kids. Um, I think we need to be cognizant of the legitimate fear that staff has when you're dealing with, especially your average teacher on the older side, has comorbidities, getting them to come back to school. Some of them might not want to. Um, I have been pushing for ways to help uh, facilitate in-person learning by using our paraprofessionals here in Rochester. Uh, we have a lot of paraprofessionals and uh, teaching aides who are out of work that we could put them back to work by having them in the classroom. Uh, I am open to discussion and um, interested in, in seeing where this goes. Um, while we're talking about schools, do we wanna talk about, I know a couple people had funding questions related to schools. Um, Jen, maybe um, just kind of to roll off this topic, would you be able to cover some of your legislative priorities since education kind of falls into that? Sure, Let, let's talk a little bit about um, education. You know, when I ran, 
I ran on fully funding Foundation Aid. Foundation Aid is the state program where we um, that provides funding to our schools. Uh, obviously, this is a program that hasn't been fully funded since it was started in 2007, and we are not um, going to be able to uh, fully fund it this year, obviously, because we are in an austerity budget. Uh, but what you see in the governor's proposal, and I do want to be clear that when I talk about the budget, I'm currently only talking about the governor's budget, not the final budget. Um, last year, the governor took a big chunk of um, federal CARES Act aid and used it to backfill cuts to education. Um, that was not ideal because that federal money was for COVID issues. It was for a cost of PPE and things schools were needing to do with technology to facilitate remote learning. He's trying to do the same thing this year. It's not the whole amount, but it's like two and a half billion dollars. And we are fighting to make sure that the federal money that has come down for education is given to the school on top of what the state's responsibility is to pay for. And that is probably our, our biggest issue. I could drill down, we'd be here all night if I talked to you about all of the, um, the school issues. I know someone had asked me a BOCES question too, because BOCES funding had been wholly cut from the budget. And that's another thing we are fighting for tremendously as well. BOCES is uh, essential to many kids. I was a beneficiary, beneficiary of BOCES uh, education when I was in middle school. Uh, I think it led very much to me being where I am today, that I had access to those programs. Uh, so we are fighting for BOCES funding as well. Um, when I entered this year, uh, it kind of didn't matter what my legislative priorities were because my legislative priorities are getting through a pandemic and getting us back to work. That's, it's forced upon us. This is, um, has to be our number one priority. Uh, so we are working every day on the vaccine rollout. And um, right now there is a work group in the assembly that is putting together plans for economic recovery. Uh, we have, I, because I'm on local governments, because I'm on economic development, uh, these are issues we talk about a lot. Uh, I know in our region here, um, my particular district is heavily suburban. So most of the businesses in my district, in this district, uh, are small. Uh, and I, prior to this was uh, employed by a small business. Both my parents were employed by small businesses. Small businesses are the backbone of our economy. So making sure that our small businesses survive this economic crisis and can get back on their feet when we're done is my number one economic development priority. Uh, and that's gonna come in the form of, uh, as far as I'm concerned, bailouts. If I can bail out Lehman Brothers, I can bail out small businesses, I can bail out small landlords. I want you to know all, I hear a lot from small landlords that they are struggling, that the programs that are set up are not sufficient, that um, too, there's too much onus on the tenants to file for the, the benefits. We all have been talking about this recently about figuring out a way um, to help our small landlords get access to funding um, so that they can maintain their homes because we're going to have a housing deficit when this is done. People are going to start selling off. Uh, I want you to know that, that we hear all of that. We genuinely do. And it's something that we're constantly focused on. Uh, and another huge piece for me uh, is childcare. Uh, I ran on a childcare platform. I am a daycare mom. Um, I have for a large portion <laughs> of my son's life paid more for daycare than student loans, paid more for daycare than my mortgage. Uh, I know what that burden is. And I think very often when we talk about childcare, we talk about the subsidies. We talk about people on the lower end of the spectrum. Right now, if you qualify for subsidies in New York State, uh, only 17% of those that qualify actually get the subsidies. So we're working on ways, again, I would get, I need a whiteboard to talk to you about it, but uh, we're working on ways to expand that, not just to cover the people who would qualify for subsidies now, but for the people in the middle who don't make enough to comfortably pay for daycare, who are choosing to stay home, to leave their career or have another, and to have another kid. Um, and we need to fill in that middle ground. We need to make daycare, not just any daycare, but quality daycare, affordable for working families. 
Uh, and we have a plan. Me and Sarah Clark up in uh, the Irondequoit Maplewood area, another new assembly person. Th this is our passion project. This is what we're doing. Uh, Rochester right now rules the Children and Families Committee. Damon Meeks, Sarah Clark, me, and Marjorie Burns are all on the Children and Families Committee. Uh, so that is an enormous priority for us here. Uh, and uh, I think lastly, again, I want to focus on not just environmental issues, but very, very specifically solid waste disposal. Um, people are going to think Jen Lunsford and think solid waste disposal, <laughs> but uh, I want that to be our, our issue. Uh, I was the only person in the entire environmental budget hearing to bring it up. Uh, and I want that to be a more commonly discussed issue. So I'm going to be banging that drum. Um, it has been an hour. It is 6.30. I have gotten to, I think, 10 questions. Uh, do people want to stay? <laughs> I know that more than an hour of Zoom is a lot to ask of people. Um, so what I'm going to do is give everyone permission to, to drop out. I will stay, uh, but there's no, <laughs> no offense to me. No one's watching you. Um, I have been on Zoom since 8 a.m. I understand many of you have as well. So it, I'll, I'm gonna stay for a little bit longer. Uh, I'm checking here um, to see if I'm hearing from other staff. Um, libraries, let's talk about libraries. Where is Julianne Wise? She had a libraries question. She gone, did I lose Julie? Oh, sorry. I'm ah, she was there I'm before. Distracted. Yeah, sorry. Julianne, is that what you said? Julianne, I think she's gone. Yeah, it looks like she, she was there before. Up. That's fine. I'm going to ask her a question anyway. School libraries are funded through the library's budget, not the education budget. And our library budget has been cut 5% across the board. Uh, I heart libraries. My office right now is above the Fairport Library. I couldn't love libraries more. I'm probably one of the only people in the state who actually asked to be on the libraries committee. Uh, and it's because libraries are um, an essential public benefit that is, I think, too often ignored. Uh, school libraries in particular, they're some of the only libraries uh, some kids have access to. Uh, so we are going to fight to make sure that uh, our budget uh, particularly on the school library side, is um, fought for. I know that a lot of schools, when they were making cuts, the school librarians, the first ones to go. Uh, but know that I hear you libraries. I see you libraries. Uh, if we, we need to think of libraries as part of our um, broader economic uh, recovery plan because libraries help pe people find work. They train people on how to write resumes. They are some of the only online access people have, faxing access. When people are applying to jobs, they go to libraries. Uh, we need to leverage all the wonderful things our libraries do. I don't know if you guys know how amazing our Monroe County library system is. Uh, not only can you get books and DVDs from our libraries, you can rent fishing rods. We have a uh, library in the city that has a toy library where kids can come and check out toys. Um, it's, they're an amazing public resource and uh, I will fight for them. Not only am I on the libraries committee, but over on uh, the west side of the county, Josh Jensen is the ranking Republican on libraries. So you have a lot of library advocates here. Um, we uh, saw Julianne and then something else occurred to me. Who was it? I saw someone's name and it reminded me of their question. I know I can't remember who it was. Um, Aaron is asking me about Bill A416. We got a million emails about this. So I'm just going to say this out loud. Bill A146 is a bill written in 2015 by a, a downstate assembly person that would require um, vaccination and uh, mandatory isolation for people um, in, who are infected with certain contagious disease. It was written during the Ebola outbreak. It was reintroduced as a matter of course. Lots of people when they have bills, they just kind of like have a big giant pile of bills that didn't go anywhere and they get reintroduced every year as a matter of course. The New York State Assembly authors over 10,000 bills a year. They vote on less than a thousand of them. The vast majority of them die in committee. 
That bill is died in committee every single year. It has no Senate sponsor. It is not a bill that anyone is even seriously considering. Someone picked it up as if it was something that was written for COVID and was immediately imminent. That bill ain't going nowhere. It has never gone anywhere. Uh, no one has any interest in it. So I feel um, safe that no one is going to be voting on that bill this year. Uh, I, I don't think anyone is taking it seriously. I have not heard that from anybody. Um, all right, I'm gonna pop through here a little bit more. I have all these questions, but I wanna see if people are talking about particular issues. Jen, I was just asked if you support any of the wealth tax bills and if yes, which ones? So I ran on the wealth tax bills. There are right now, I think there's four different wealth tax bills. Uh, and I do not co-sponsor any of them. And I'm gonna give you a real inside politics reason as to why. None of those bills are gonna pass. This is gonna pass in the budget. Uh, this happens sometimes where people have bills. I have a bill. I'm actually very excited. I was able to pick up a bill uh, where a previous member had left to cap childcare subsidy co-pays at 20%. That's a bill that's been banging around for a few years. I was able to pick it up, real excited. Uh, it's in the budget. That bill's in the budget. So that bill, will not pass. The budget will do its job. I'm glad to see the work done, even if I don't get the credit for it. Uh, these, uh, well, uh, I'm going to say the ultra millionaires tax. That's the general term for these uh, taxes that raise the top tax rate and increase the tax brackets. Um, I ran on supporting an increase over $5 million a year. Um, I do not support some of the lower threshold bills. Um, the 300,000 or the 500,000, I think that's too low. Um, so uh, I don't think any of those have a chance of passing. The governor has signaled very, very, very heavily <laughs> that he does not support that particular tax. But we uh, say revenue raiser every single day. Um, every single time anybody in the assembly talks to anybody else in the assembly, we say revenue raiser. We see it. Uh, not only the ultra millionaires tax, but there's a lot of these um, stock buyback transfers, uh, stock buybacks and the stock transfer tax, separate issues. Uh, in 2015, we uh, just stopped taxing uh, yachts and luxury planes. So we should probably tax yachts and luxury planes, right? Um, I don't think now is the time to not have sales tax on your luxury yacht. Uh, there are um, a number of, of bills in the pipeline that I think um, are very seriously uh, being considered like legalizing marijuana, which would generate, uh, I think the current projection is $300 billion a year. Um, right now, the fight, and actually the fight last year, is in between whether or not to legalize it, it's how, and um, where the money goes. Where the money goes is the real problem. There's two competing arguments right now. One is currently in the governor's executive budget, and the other one is going to be in the assembly budget. That's the um, bill being carried by Crystal People Stokes, our um, majority leader. Uh, one of them basically says, we're going to legalize marijuana and that money is going to go into the general fund. I'll let you guess whose that is. And the other one uh, wants the money to go back into the communities that have been most negatively impacted by drug enforcement. So that's the argument we're really having about around marijuana legalization right now. I know someone else had a question about marijuana legalization. It's going to happen. It's just a matter of we're, we're banging out the details. I think this is the year. Um, the other uh, big time, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars revenue raiser that is already in the budget is mobile sports betting. Um, mobile sports betting has been banging around for a really long time. This is the year it looks like it's going to happen. Um, it's projected to raise uh, hundreds of millions of dollars. There's also, um, you know, when you talk about ways to raise revenue, um, you can be kind of creative about it. You know, one thing that uh, we've been talking about a lot is, um, um, expanding big game hunting to kids who are 12 and 13 and expanding the year, uh, the time frame for crossbow. Uh, and what that does is help facilitate licenses. Like we're going to earn money from more people getting hunting licenses. Uh, and those are ways to, you know, deal with two issues at once. Uh, so we are trying to be creative. I do support all of the, uh, the wealth taxes, I'll call them broadly. Um, and I will take what I can get in the budget, knowing that that is a real fight between the legislature and the executive.
popping up through here. I am going to see if I can call on someone else here. Uh, also, raise your hand if you'd like to speak. Um, people also, several people asked me about the Erie Canal opening, uh, which was the most Parks and Rec question I could have gotten. I was very excited to receive so many Erie Canal questions. Um, those of you, since these questions came in, we have been updated about the shortened canal season. And I do hear you about the impact that's going to have on our businesses. Uh, the canal, especially, I, I can see it from where I am. You could hear it earlier, is uh, a major uh, economic driver for our region. Uh, and we are going to be in discussion with the Canal Corporation about ways to um, try to expand that season back out. Um, it's, it's a good point and it's something that we're gonna bring up. So I, I appreciate everybody asking uh, the canal questions. We have two hands up. Um, I have John, who we will allow first. John, you can unmute yourself. Hi, hey. Hi, Hi John. Um, so my question actually is about what you started talking about right to kick off the Zoom chat. Um, about COVID. Um, specifically, it's about food service workers and when we will be eligible to receive the vaccine. Now, I know that they just announced today, um, Chloe sent me some really nice emails, you know, showing your concern for my issue. So I really do appreciate that because the email I got from, from Adam Bella was not as uh, concerned, uh, was not as uh, careful. But um, I just... I think like, I wanna speak on behalf of all of, uh, food service workers. We're kind of disappointed that there seems to be this subjective uh, de decision-making about who gets the vaccine when, especially when like grocery store workers are in 1A, but like we're in 1B. And I just, I'm trying to find people to kind of advocate for us and speak on our behalf because there doesn't seem to be many people doing so right now. And actually I'm the only one who actually has this issue in this call. Uh, specifically, but I just wanted to try and speak to any representative I could about this, and hopefully I can just get your ear and maybe you can talk to the right people and sort of speak on my behalf and the rest of us. But, I do just want to verify, you are in 1B, right? Yes. Is that correct? Uh, well, it, they did say okay. food service workers, yeah, yep. So just to let everybody know, there is no, there is no longer a distinction between 1A and 1B. And that is part of the problem with the rollout is we let all the 1B people into 1A. Uh, basically, like before 1A was done, 1B opened and there's not enough vaccines. So now you have 1A people and 1B people mixing together, but you all have the same access to appointments. So you, I mean, there's been some issues where like the governor changes rules I swear to God, I woke up one morning and it was over 70 and the people called me about over 65. Um, they are prioritizing people over 65 right now. Um, and that's, the reality is it's a supply problem. Um, I do hear you and I've been getting a lot of calls from different groups of people, CPS workers um, who aren't considered law enforcement and social workers that go into people's houses. Uh, the groupings of people does seem arbitrary and I don't have a good response for you about why one group versus another group. Uh, in fact, I have stopped advocating for one group over another because there's too many groups that have valid points uh, that yeah. you know, I would just be constantly advocating because everyone has a good point. Teachers need vaccines, food service workers need vaccines, home health care aides who aren't associated with hospital systems and aren't technically medical staff, CPS workers, social workers. Um, all I can say is that if you are in 1B, you're in the pipeline right now. Um, you are super valuable and thank you so much for the job that you're doing because it is essential. And I think one benefit of this horrible situation is that we've really been able to see what makes our society tick and who's important and that just because someone makes minimum wage doesn't make their job minimal. Uh, and I wanna thank you for going to work and putting yourself in harm's way, um, that, that it means something to us. Uh, and I hope that we get more vaccines so that you can get in line. Um, but that, you know, again, thank you very, very much um, 
I don't know, John, if you muted yourself or if uh, I did. Or... I just wanted to make sure I wasn't breathing and talking. I just want to make sure that. <laughs> um, uh, thank you so much for you, your John. kind words, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. I really do appreciate that. And thank I appreciate you. you. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks. Um, Steve. Yes, Steve. And then also, um, if you could just touch on um, disabilities, people getting access to that. But let's have our friend Steve talk first. His hand has been up. Sure. Uh, let's see. Steve, uh, it looks like it's not available because Steve is using an older version of Zoom. We Steve, can you, can you please put your question into the Q&A and we will circle back after Jen yeah. reaches this other point? Yeah. Okay, I'll talk about disabilities. Um, I know some people uh, had raised to me the question of how someone who can't leave their home um, because of disability can get access to a vaccine outstanding question that I'm still trying to get the answer to. And I will let you know when I find out that is a very, very good question because there are tons of people who are eligible for the vaccine who have actual access problems getting to where the vaccine is. Um, so I'll, I'm certain that we're going to, to bring that up. Um, people with disabilities um, are an incredibly underserved population of people even before COVID. Uh, and as someone who worked with people with disabilities for my entire legal career, I have a very soft spot. Um, I know that I got some questions. Oh, is, hang on one side. If we're so late in the call, look at you people hanging on. I appreciate it. Some of the people I wanted to, I want to ask Brittany Jensik who'd asked me a, a disabilities question. Um, making sure that um, there's parity in pay this is, again, getting in the weeds a little bit, but for our direct service providers who work in nonprofits versus work in the state, uh, we need to pay direct service providers better for doing the very hard work of taking care of people in our lives who we love, but who need more help than we can give them. Uh, and that's something that I hear and that's something that I feel. And I want you to know um, that I'm always going to be a vocal advocate for parity pay for, um, serving communities with disabilities with dignity uh, and making sure that they have a voice in government. Um, I'm happy to answer more specific questions on that if people have them. Um, I do see a Q&A, is that from Steve? Uh, Steve has a phone number. He said he called, let me see if I can find, which Steve doesn't have his phone number up. Is this Steven? I have the question in front of me, if you'd like. This is the, so he asked, what can you do as a lawmaker to stop the town of Parenton from violating state law governing town's actions, allowing a spot zoning to appease one property owner in detriment to the surrounding property owners and in violation of state law and the written comprehensive plan that the town is currently operating under? So unfortunately, without being able to talk to Steve, this is a hard question to address because it's, it's obviously extremely specific. Steve, just so you know, I have just made a note to reach out to you tomorrow so that we can, um, we, we already discussed, we want to get in contact with you and help you with the local, you know, elected so that you get an answer. And this is it. This does seem like a question that does ultimately come down to local government. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. figuring out who the right person to talk to can be very challenging because we have so many layers of government. There is, even within a village government, there's committees. We have villages and towns and counties and state and federal. Um, always feel free to reach out to us and we're happy to be a resource to you to help That's you find job. yeah, the yeah. right people to talk to. I'm, I'm always happy to serve as that resource for you. Um, popping through here to see if I am seeing any, did Linda have a question? Let's see, we covered canals. We cover nursing homes, food service workers, COVID. Some people have just asked uh, what we do to stay informed about issues. Um, and I'm gonna tell you that staying informed about issues is my full-time job. Uh, Chloe here sends us a news summary every single day. Um, though I'm gonna tell you that uh, the paltry coverage of local and state news generally results in news stories about things I knew about three days before. Um, 
But uh, Albany keeps us uh, very well informed. We get updates all the time about um, expected uh, happenings in legislation that we're going to be voting on. Uh, but the re reality is, is I take meetings. The, what my day looks like is this end on end on end on end Zoom calls because people seem to think that because I can take Zoom calls that I don't ever need to eat or use the bathroom. So I take calls nonstop all day. I tell you, um, you should, should have seen my calendar today. Uh, from 8 a.m. until about noon, I was on two Zoom calls at once and they changed. I took, I think, seven meetings during that time and sometimes had them on different screens. Um, I try to not do that, but today was a little wacky because we will schedule meetings and then the legislature will come in and schedule something on top of our meetings. So we do what we can. Um, but in those meetings, I talk to constituents. I talk to nonprofits. I talk to lobbyists. Lobbyists very often are nonprofits. I talk to stakeholders and agencies. And this is how I learn about things. You know, I know people don't like the term lobbying because it sounds gross. But when you come to my office to tell me you want schools open, you're lobbying me. That's what that action is called. And I learn from you when you do that. When, um, you know, the League of Conservation Voters comes to talk to me about extended producer responsibility, I learn from them. Uh, when uh, constituents come and tell me that they want high-risk sports open, I learn from them that way. And I am uh, very lucky to have a great memory and the ability to retain things I read very well. Uh, and it ultimately comes down to that. But it's because I talk to people all day long and you guys tell me what's important. Uh, and then I also have the world's greatest staff uh, who also keeps things in order and reminds me of what's important they will shift the top. I get, Chloe, how many emails do we get a day? Uh, <laughs> I sign on and there's at least 50 from overnight. And then throughout the day, there's at least a hundred throughout the day. Um, so what they will do is go through all my emails and then they tell me what matters. <laughs> <laughs> what is important, what, so uh, we get summaries at the end of the week too, you know, 10 people called about A416. Uh, if you call my office and you, or you send me an email or you send me one of those form letters that's like, I don't like this thing, we write that down uh, and we take note. Uh, even if it's just you calling up and saying, I, I like this bill, I don't like this bill. We write it down. Uh, we hear what you say. Uh, and that's our number one priority is constituent work because that's why I'm here. I'm here to serve you and I'm here to learn the less fun stuff <laughs> so that I can help uh, make the best decision for our community. Um, but I think one of the things that has made us successful so far and will make us successful in the future is focusing on constituent work and communicating as best as possible. This is the first of what's going to be minimally four town halls. I pledged during my campaign to have four town halls a year. And when I say town hall, I mean something like this that is not subject specific. So you can come to me. I am the avatar for government. And if you want to throw tomatoes at me, that's what I'm here for. Um, but this also is helpful for me to hear about your issues and to learn what's going on. Uh, so we may have other forums. Like I had one specifically about high acres. Uh, we're going to be having a delegation wide um, town hall in a couple weeks. There will be other opportunities, but I want you to know that I have these just for you for this exact purpose. Um, so I hope that that answers your questions. Uh, we are coming up on seven o'clock. So I am going to take one more question if anyone has one. And while oh, I see some things in the Q and A here. One of them is Steve and the other one is uh, the press release about the Erie Canal. Okay, perfect, yes. Um, let me take a quick peek through these questions, see if I can find a quick one to answer that we haven't already covered. We've covered a lot of ground. And thank you everyone for sticking it out. I really appreciate all of you. And for um, any of you who, you know, if you had a more specific question that wasn't covered tonight, if you still have questions, I dropped our email in the chat. And like I said, I check this all day long. We respond to it all day long. Sometimes before Jen goes to sleep, she just sends a couple responses. So if, if there's any looming answers that you need, please feel free to reach out to us through that email.
man, we really, we covered all the questions in one way or another. We already touched on them. Um, all right. Chain pharmacies, I did chain pharmacies. Oh, no, okay, so Kathy Tadio asked me about how to request grant or member item funding for nonprofits. I'm going to direct you to our office for that, but member items aren't a thing that exists anymore. So member items are like pork, that, like what you think of as pork, that like I, I get to give $15,000 to the fire district or whatever it is. Um, the governor eliminated those um, probably about eight years ago now. Um, so the way that system works now is there are government grants, uh, but they're reimbursable. You have to spend the money and then get reimbursed by the state. It's very complicated and I will explain to you better how that works. Um, but yeah, that the like budget line member items don't exist in New York State anymore. Um, so, okay, I think we're gonna wrap up. And again, I wanna thank everybody so much for coming. Again, please follow us on social media uh, because it's the best way to get updated. My Twitter handle, I'm still using my campaign um, handles at Vote Jen Lunsford um, because we feel like it's the best way to communicate with people. We don't use government funding for that. Um, we don't uh, use government um, resources for that. Uh, I feel very, very strongly about keeping those things separate. Um, but it just allows us to communicate the best possible way uh, to the most people. Uh, so follow us on Facebook. You can follow me on Instagram. It's just going to be retweets of what I do on Twitter. I'm really bad at Instagram. I'm going to turn 39 on Saturday. Instagram is not for me. Uh, so uh, if you do have questions, always email us. Uh, thank you guys so much for sticking it out. Uh, I hope to see you in person. Uh, when the weather gets better, let's do it in the park. Um, thank you so much. Have a great night. Thank you for coming. Thank you.